Hello, everyone. Do you know that many software applications are underusing hardware resources? That means that your application, or many software applications, could run potentially faster while consuming less energy. And this is because today computing systems are including many types of hardware, like multi-core CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, or even custom design chips, like Google that has designed like tensor processing units. And you have all of this available for increasing performance. And expert programmers uh, know this. And what they do normally is they take existing applications and they rewrite a portion of it into low-level languages like CUDA, OpenCL, or even C code, the new standard. Those are the languages that allow you to run on heterogeneous hardware. But this is a very tedious process, OK? First of all, because we have now more than one type of hardware, the, user need to, the developers need to know which portion of the code correspond better to each hardware. And they, this, this is because there is no a single hardware that better uh, executes all type of workloads. So the programmer has to know which portion are best suitable for each one. Then the programmer has to port, uh, you have to know architectural detail. For example, have to mess around the third scheduler, you know, the data partitioning, and all of these tricks can help you to increase performance. Plus, if you want to increase even further performance, you have to go deep into the architecture. For example, GPUs have different level of uh, tier memory. And you have to know that one level is in one cache. You can copy data there if you want to, but cache is not coherent. So barriers are up to the programmer. And when the new generation of GPUs came along, or FPGAs, or accelerator, you have to repeat this process again. Not from scratch, but you have to change your code. Ah, this is a very tedious process. Um, I, I hope you feel my pain. So instead of doing that, let's imagine the following. Let's imagine that we have a software system that can take automatically a high-level program. It doesn't mean only C or C++, but especially in this community, we know that programmers can, can become also from other communities like Java, R, Ruby, Python, and automatically executing on heterogeneous hardware. Wouldn't be that great. And because we are in this dreaming mode, Let's also imagine that we can also perform task migration across devices. That would be cool, right? Guess what? I have just defined Tornado VM. This is exactly what Tornado VM does. So Tornado VM is a plugin to OpenJDK and Graal that allows you to run Java, R, Ruby, Python, Scala programs on heterogeneous hardware without changing any code of line, any line of code. Even more, with Tornado VM, we can perform dynamically task migration across devices without restarting the application and without any knowledge from the program perspective about the actual hardware. So in my talk, I will explain to you the Tornado VM, but before that, I will explain some background. So don't worry if you haven't heard about GPUs that much or the FPGA is something new. Don't worry at all. I will explain to you the basics, and I will explain to you how we use it from the Tornado VM perspective. So you are still in the right talk. Later, I will introduce to you how you can use Tornado, how you can execute it, and then I will show you some internal details. So I'm a compiler engineer. I would like to know everything inside, and I, show, I would like to show you this passion with you as well. So I will show you how we can compile code at runtime. So basically, internal details about the JIT compilation. And um, I will show you also how can we migrate execution at runtime. And stay with me, I will also show you some demos, so hopefully I can convince you that this type of technology is useful for, in general, managed runtime languages. Before that, just a quick word about, a quick word about myself. So this is my first time in this conference. I'm Juan Fumero, and a postdoc now at the University of Manchester. And I'm currently the lead developer of Tornado VM project. OK, so let's get started. Question, why should we care about heterogeneous devices anyways? Is something important. To motivate the answer, I show you here three different microarchitectures. An Intel microarchitecture on the left-hand side, a GPU, and an FGA. And let's focus on the Intel one, on the left-hand side. This one is Ice Lake microarchitecture. It's one of the latest by Intel. And this one has a physical course, plus AVX instructions, plus, it's an interesting one, it has a GPU that is inside. It's called integrated GPU. If you run on this one and you use all of these available, which is quite difficult, you can get up to one teraflop of performance. Now let's look at the GPU. 
This one is Pascal microarchitecture. It's already two generations old from NVIDIA. This one is 16 nanometers technology. And this one, look at this. Instead of eight physical cores, we have 3,500 physical cores that you can use. This gives you up to 10 teraflop of performance. Okay? It's much, much higher than a single CPU. And similar situation applies for FPGAs. This one by Intel, you can get up to 10 teraflops of performance. So during my talk, I will be talking about a lot about GPUs and FPGAs. So just in case, let's set up the terminology. Um, I guess many of you know this already, but uh, GPUs stands for Graphics Processing Unit. It's basically used, okay, at the beginning, it was mainly used for rendering and computer graphics. However, a few years ago, researchers realized that some of the stages to, com to do the rendering, okay, the, the GPU implement some stages like computing textures, volumes, vertices, and so on. Some of the stages can be used for general purpose computation. And that's where CUDA and OpenCL come from. So where we can use the GPU not only for computing graphics, but also for general purpose computation, physics, machine learning, deep learning, Bitcoin, this kind of stuff. Um, this one I highlighted before is um, my, uh, Pascal microarchitecture. I want to highlight two things from here. Apart from the programming model, which you have to learn it if you want to use it, could be OpenCL, CUDA, or any other, you have to know architecture details in order to use them efficiently. And that, for many users, could be, you know, handicap. You don't have to have, in my opinion, you don't have to be an expert to use it. Could be a biologist, a psychologist, why not? They actually have the need to run on those devices. So perhaps we need high level abstractions. Let's define quickly what is an FPGA. Uh, are you familiar with FPGAs? How many of you have heard about FPGAs? Okay, that's much more than I expect. Fine, if you don't know, don't worry. Uh, if you use Tornado, you don't have to know, but I'm going to explain to you anyways. So an FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array, and basically it's a piece of hardware that is empty, empty after manufacturing. So it's up to the programmer what to run in there. In some sense, it's like physically wiring your applications into hardware. To do so, the FPGA provides with logic slides like lookup tables, flip flops, program programmable memory, and DSPs. DSPs are specific functions to perform math operations. And that could give you a lot of performance and a lot of energy saving because you, co you just run what you need, basically. However, the programmability here is, is a big issue. Normally, you program in BHDL, you know, very low, this kind of stuff. More recently, um, main vendors provide, uh, you can program using OpenCL. And I'm telling you this because Tornado targets FPGAs. And Tornado targets FPGA at the method level, which means that we can physically wire your Java methods into hardware. How cool is that? Okay. So far, I have been talking about pure hardware. Um, but we need a way to program them, right? So, if you want to use GPUs and FPGAs, you might target something like CUDA, OpenCL, SQL, C++, something like that, right? But we know that there are a lot of developers. If you want to use it from Java, for example, or for Python, for Ruby, you have to plug in right now an external library. But there is no such a virtual machine. There is not such a thing that automatically you can get, target a Java or Python program and run it directly without any knowledge on the heterogeneous hardware. And that's what we propose. We, that's what we call a heterogeneous virtual machine. So basically, it's a synonym of Tornado VM. With that, you can target Java, but also other languages. This is new. We released a new version last week. Uh, actually, at the beginning, we only run Java. Now we can run more than Java. I will show you a demo, actually, later on. With this strategy, you can run on any type of hardware. Cool. Let me show you how. And let's start with a demo. Um, I want to show you the suite first, and then I will show you the details. So this one is called Kinect Fusion. You know the Kinect, the Microsoft camera, uh, right? So this one is uh, Kinect is recording a, real, a room, and the goal of the application is to render in real time the whole application. What do we mean by real time? So the human perceives real time around 30 frames, 30 images per second. That's the quality of service. The whole application is written in Java. And it's around 7,000 lines of Java code. 
Okay, and let me show you. By the way, it's open source. It's in this link. And let me show you uh, the application. I record a video just in case. But. Okay, let me explain. First of all, I'm going to run in pure Java. Okay, there is no acceleration underneath. It's just OpenJDK, OpenJDK A actually. On the left hand side, you're going to see the input. On the right hand side, you're going to see the output. And there's the input and different setup for the Kinect Fusion, like death scene, light scene. The application, trust me, is already running. It's around 1.5 frames per second. It's extremely slow. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to stop the application. I'm going to reset it. And I'm going to use Tornado. And Tornado has different, you know, you can run on different devices. I'm going to set first to run on the multi-core. When we choose to run Tornado on an Intel or an AMD CPU, we run a multi-core configuration. And hopefully, we can see that something is faster. Well, it's hard to see, but actually, it's around four frames per second. That was recorded on my laptop. It's four core machine. It's not that bad, right? Cool. So I'm going to do now, I'm going to do a switching. Um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to reset. And I'm going to use now the NVIDIA GPU that is available on my laptop, the 1050. And voila. In a few seconds, you get the whole rendering okay, of the whole room. Yes. It's just Java, okay? We just offload the Java code onto the GPU. Right. Let me continue with the presentation. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how this is done. Okay, I'm going to give you an overview of Tornado VM. Um, Tornado VM it has, it has um, a layer architecture plus a micro kernel architecture. I'm talking about the software side. On the top level, we have an API. You might wonder, why do we have an API? Well, we, what we do is we exploit parallelism. We don't detect parallelism. Detection is a very hard problem. So we need a way, at least, to identify which core regions you want to offload. This is done through what we call a task-based model. Each task corresponds to an existing Java method. Okay? And we can combine many tasks on a single compilation unit, and that's what we call a task schedule. Right? And then we actually expose two annotations, add parallel and add reduce, to just identify which loops you want to parallelize. However, parallelization is what we call relaxed parallel semantics. So that means that even if the user annotates the code, Tornado will double check that that, that code can be parallelized. Otherwise, you just bail out and execute the sequential code. So we don't force parallelism. Uh, then we have a runtime system that we First of all, we'll optimize how data is flowing across the tasks. And this is because, I mean, many of you know GPUs and FPGAs already, so you know that G normally GPUs and FPGAs don't share memory with the main CPU. So we need to allocate first the data over there and then the do the data transfer. And that takes time, exactly go going through PCI Express. If we can save data transfers, we can get speed as overall. And that's the goal of the data flow optimizer. Once we have the data flow optimized, we generate new bytecodes. And those are bytecodes that are executing on top of Java bytecodes. Okay? Don't worry, this is very abstract. I know this is just to give an overview. I will focus later on step by step. Then, we, because we have our own bytecode interpret, sorry, our own bytecodes, we need a bytecode interpreter to run those. That's very simple, actually, how to orchestrate execution. That's a very simple process. One of those bytecodes is launch. Launch this method on this device. The first time we launch, we call the gcompiler and say, now, compile this method. For that, we extend Graal, the Graal JIT compiler only, to produce, to generate OpenCL. Okay? Uh, so with this strategy, we can currently target uh, NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, Intel Integrated Graphics, uh, FPGAs by Intel, and Xilinx. We can run on top of OpenJDK 8 and Graal VN 19.3. Okay. Okay. So let's go deep. I'm going to start with API. I'm going to start with an example. I show you here a typical, you know, very easy matrix multiplication. A Java class called compute and one method called MXM. And then I show you here the sequential code, sequential code to run matrix multiplication. And the first thing we do with Tornado is to annotate the sequential code with the annotation I showed you before, the add parallel. With this, we are telling the user tells Tornado these two loops might be parallel. 
The fact that the user, as I said before, annotates the code doesn't mean it's going to be paralyzed later on. But just as, this is just as a hint for the compiler to where to go, right? That's the first thing we do. The second thing is we build the task schedule I showed you before. For doing that, we have an object called task schedule. We pass a name. Could be any random name, foo, bar, whatever. We put that a runtime to change the device, for example. Let me show you an example. And then we call task.task.task. .task .task. Each task is a reference to an existing Java method. Here we say class compute method MXM, and then the rest is a normal parameter for our invocation call, okay? Then we have another call called stream out, and this is because normally we don't share memory. GPU has some memory, right? So we need a way to synchronize data again. We, go, we do that through the stream out operation. And then we call execute, that's all. And by the way, we can add as many tasks as we want. In this case, I show you just one, but you can have you know, 20, 100 tasks, whatever. Okay, so to run this, we just type tornado and your class. In fact, this is because we are lazy people in our team. Uh, you just type, actually, tornado is an alias to Java plus all the parameters to enable tornado, basically. But this is just Java. Okay. So now you, have, you know everything about Tornado you, you, at the user level. And I'm going to show you a live demo now to run the matrix multiplication. So, so let me explain what I'm going to do. I'm going to run with Tornado command, but um, I'm going to run first the sequential code. So it, I have a flag to indicate don't, don't build the task schedule, just run the, the, the code with uh, OpenJDK. And I'm running this code multiple times, 100 times, so don't take this as a benchmark problem. It's just to show you a quick demo. And let's see the time. I'm going to track the time for each, uh, uh, each iteration. I'm going to run the matrix multiplication 100 times, okay? So first of all, the sequential, this is the size of the matrix. And as you can see, it's taking around 240 milliseconds per iteration. Okay, I'm not going to wait 100 iterations. Um, okay, let me... Now I'm going to enable Tornado. And the default device, I will show you later, is going to run on the GPU that I have here on my system. And if I run Tornado, boom, each iteration takes around four milliseconds. You can say, ah, no, 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 no. I don't trust you. OK. <laughs> Far enough. Uh, you can tell Tornado to, um, to, tell, uh, to give me debug information. And that will tell me in which device you're running, OK? So I run the debug info, and now it's telling me you're running on the NVIDIA 1050, it's NVIDIA that I have on my laptop. Uh, in fact, we can change the device. Uh, but before changing the device, let me show you, we generate OpenCR underneath for you. And you can enable this with print kernel. Let me pipe this to see this. And this is the OpenCL kernel we generate for you. It looks very ugly, this is because we generate code from Graal. Graal is SSA representation, and we generate code based on SSA, but it's legal OpenCL code, okay? Um, you don't have to go that deep if you don't want to. By the way, if you want to tune the code afterwards, you can produce the code, manually tune it, and plug in later on. That's actually the process we do when we, do the, uh, we, we build the compiler. Okay, let me show you now how we can run on a other device. So if I run this command, tornado slash slash devices, the devices will tell me I have four devices available. The default one is the NVIDIA 1050. I have a multi-core. I have another multi-core, but using different OpenCL driver. And here I have an Intel integrated graphics. So let's do that. Oh. Let me uh, remove the pipe. And I uh, remember that I get names to the task schedule, and that's what they are useful. So I can say this task with this name running on device 03, which is the device of the integrated graph. And running also with the debug info. Yeah, that's fine. And now, boom, I'm running on the Intel integrated graphics. If I have a FPGA plugin here, that would be cool, but for now, there is no laptop with FPGA, as far as I know. I could even run it there. OK, um, I hope I convinced you that this type of technology is useful. Let's go back to the presentation. Uh, let's, talk, let's start talking about the details, OK? So remember, this is a very general overview. You annotate the code, you build a task schedule. There is a magic box there. 
And then that magic box will generate an OpenCL code, which means that we need another compiler later on to, to generate the actual binary for this. And without a strategy, you can run on any other device. In fact, we can plug in any other, other languages on, apart from Java. We can plug in Node.js, Python, R, Ruby, JavaScript, Scala. To do so, we go through GraalVM, okay? Um, so still, we provide, Tornado is written using Java. We have the dot classes here. And there is a component in Graal uh, called Truffle that is uh, it's a framework that allows you to run that other languages on top of Graal. And there's a component called Polyglot that is talking to other languages, okay? And that guy is gonna tell, ah, some of the code here, some of the classes here, if you like, are in Java, so talk to them, but these Java classes are expressed with Tornado. So that's why we can go through Node.js, let's say, to the GPU. In fact, I'm gonna show you an example now with Node.js and the Mandelbrot. You know the Mandelbrot uh, typical, okay? Okay, let me, show, let me show you that. So I'm gonna run that. I'm gonna actually run in a Docker. That's the command. Uh, ah, well, let me show you first the code, actually. Um, yes. This is the class Mandelbrot. It's just Java, okay? Where we have the two annotations. That's the code to, to run Java, the, the Mandelbrot computation. And we have one method called compute that we, we will build here the task schedule. And then we have a method called sequential that we'll call just the sequential code. Then we have um, our server.js, okay? And on the entry point, I'm using the express uh, module. On the entry point, we'll print a bunch of messages. And the interesting part is here. I'm calling a Java type. This is because I'm using Truffle on the Polyglot engine. I'm calling the, the Java type Mandelbrot.compute which is the one that builds the, the task schedule to run on the GPU, potentially. I'm printing the time, and that code will actually generate an image, and I'm gonna print the image. If I, tap, if I type slash Java, I'm gonna do the same, but I'm gonna run the sequential code. So let's do that. I already start the server, and if I go to that direction, boom, uh, the Mandelbrot already there. It might not be that impressive to you. It takes around 1.3 seconds to compute, okay, compile and compute this image. If I uh, refresh the browser, now it's going down to 0 0.1 seconds because once we get the code, we just get it from the code cache. Now, just out of curiosity, let's run in with the sequential one. Any guesses about the time? I'm running now with OpenJDK, by the way. With slash Java, I run with OpenJDK. Five seconds, 10 seconds, 20, I think you are close. I think you are close. Still running, still running. 17 seconds, okay? And if I, I can refresh it, you can get down, maybe the G compiler can get, get seen. This is not going down 15 seconds, okay? Compared to 1.4 seconds, including G compilation on the GPU. And yeah, perhaps you can plug in your video game engine now. I don't know, that could be cool. Okay, let's continue. So remember that we have this blue box, all the magic happening here, let's open the blue box. And that's what we find. So we have a, our data flow analyzer, our runtime, and we have a big component here. It's not the biggest, but okay. It takes significant amount of time for us to build. It's the, it's the JIT compiler. Basically we extend Graal, I'm not gonna talk about the details of Graal, but has different IR representations, high level IR for architecture independent optimizations, memory optimizations, and architecture dependent optimizations. So basically what we do is we have a graph, a control flow graph, uh, and there are many nodes in there for loops, you know, data dependencies, and so on. Basically what we do is to do no replacement, depending on the optimizations we want to do. For example, uh, you want to target the GPU. You have a for loop, remove the for loop, introduce the get global ID, these kind of things. We actually have kind of between Graal and Tornado kind of 170 optimizations uh, in that process. And at the end of the process, we have the OpenCLC code. Um, that means that we need another, run, another compiler afterwards. Uh, and we, we do this by, just by calling the actual driver. So if you are using NVIDIA GPU, we just call the NVIDIA driver to get the PTX back. 
if you are using the Intel Silinx, um, sorry, Intel FPGA, we just call the Intel driver and will give us the bit stream, the configuration file, uh, back. Okay, so one of the things we do, and actually that's one of the things that take us most of, most of our time, is compile specializations. And let me tell you why we need this. So we generate OpenCL underneath. OpenCL, you know, that is a standard, right? That means that code is portable, but OpenCL, the performance is not portable, which means that if we don't change, if we don't massage the code we generate, we, we might not get the performance we want. And I show you here uh, one type of specialization we do for loops. Uh, this is the, the input code, this is the graph form. Don't worry if you can't read it, it's just an example. And then we say, okay, you are targeting GPUs, so each, uh, each loop is gonna, we transform the loop that says, um, we call like fine-grained parallelism, basically. Each thread is gonna compute its own element. If we target multi-cores, each thread is gonna compute a range of elements. We do this specialization directly in the IR. I show you for simplicity in Java code, but we do this transformation directly in the IR. And we have many optimizations for that. Let me show you what we do for FPGAs. And actually, this is very important because if we don't specialize the code for CPUs or, or GPUs, well, that's fine. Well, you're gonna get performance anyways. Not that good, but still, much, much higher than hotspot. But if we don't do optimization for FPGAs, we most likely are gonna get slow down, not even speed up, not even one X. And let me show you what we do to get speed up. So that's the Graal IR style, don't worry about the details. So one of the things we do, we introduce in the IR level, thread scheduling, which means that the IR has the knowledge of how many threads we want to execute. For example, a block of 32 by 32, 64 by 64, things like that. Then we can tune the loop and roller, uh, Graal has a good one, but it's good for CPUs. For FPGA, it's not that good. So we tune it, and just by introducing a new loop and roller, we can actually save some space, physical space on the FPGA, and that can give you better speed up. We have a bunch of optimizations. Uh, just by doing that, we go from, in our benchmark we have seen, we go from slowdown to 240x speed up. <laughs> and the, the server we execute was a four-core machine. <laughs> now you, man, you might want to use Tornado VM for some Workloads. Okay, so I'm gonna switch a bit the context. I'm gonna prepare the background I need to explain you how we can perform live task migration, which is the other big part that Tornado can do. And many, many times we define Tornado as a VM in a VM, okay? Like, like Inception, if you like. So uh, if you execute your Java program, but you don't have your task scales defined, you might get something open JDK or Graal, that's fine. Uh, if your code gets hot, potentially you're gonna reach the, com the, the specialized code, the, the compile code for CPUs. If you, have your, if you have your task schedules, we have something like this. We are gonna trigger the Tornado compiler, as I showed you before. We have our data flow analyzer and optimizer. Don't worry about the details, I will explain in the next slide. And then we generate new bytecodes. And then, because we are in this mode, we manage memory, we manage execution, we manage compilation, and we manage task migration. That's why we say that we have a VM in a VM. That's why we say actually it's a plugin to OpenJDK, right? With that strategy, we can do task migration across many devices. Okay, let me show you an example of this. We have your class compute, for example, and you have map and reduce. And we build a task schedule. In this case, we have two tasks, one pointing to map method, the other pointing to the reduce method. And then I want to highlight that we pass input, output, input, output. But the output of the first is the input of the second, and we don't use it anymore. Which means that we could potentially optimize it. And that's what we do in the graph, in the, in the graph analyzer, when we do the graph uh, analysis here of the data flow. Um, basically, we have the data coming into the first method, then we produce a result, we don't need the result coming from here. We just can keep it on the device. We have the second method, and finally we synchronize with the host again. We, we send the results back. And once we have the graph optimized, we generate bytecodes, uh, as I showed you at the very beginning. And the bytecodes are pretty simple bytecodes. Everything is enclosed be between begin and end, plus we pass an index. This guy is just the 
initial hint, initial device index to run could be a GPU, but we can change this at runtime. We, by default, we take a decision. And then we, it's a simple process, we just traverse the graph. We say copy in the first variable, then allocate the space for a second. We, need to, we don't need to copy anything. Then launch, well, many of the bytecodes are non-blocking, which means we need a way to block, okay, until the, tran the data transfer is finished. And then we launch the first method. The first time we execute this bytecode, we call Graal, well, Tornado compiler, and we compile from bytecode to OpenCL. And so on and so forth until getting the final thing. So, the Tornado bytecode, in my opinion, is a very, very simple way to orchestrate execution on heterogeneous devices. Why? Because we can do more complex things, like, let's imagine this, this is a scenario. And this is very typical, by the way. Uh, we want to process 16 gigabytes of data on a GPU that only has one gigabyte. This is very typical. GPU has only a limited amount of memory. So the way we do that is uh, through an API call called batch. We can batch execution. Uh, we have three arrays. We say batching in 300 megabytes each, so 900 megabytes, they fit into one gigabyte. We can process it. Underneath, what hap what's happening is we unfold all the bytecodes in batches. First batch, copy in, execution, copy out, second batch, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. We haven't changed the compiler, we haven't changed the runtime, nothing. Just how the bytecodes are running, that's all, right? And that's a very powerful capability. Okay, with that, mm, let me switch now to the task migration. I have all the ingredients that I need to explain this. Because we have the ability to compile and run for many devices, what we, are gonna, what we are gonna do is we are gonna span a set of Java threads. Each thread is gonna target one particular device. And each thread is gonna compile and run. We also keep another thread to run the sequential application. This is because we want to switch only if the application runs faster on the device. Only. If it's not faster, just keep with hotspot. They do a very good job. So we keep one thread to run the sequential with hotspot. And then we have a component here to make the decision. In fact, what each thread is running is an instance of the VM I just told you, the bytecodes I just told you, which is copy in, execution, copy out for all, this, uh, for all the methods that you have. And then the, the Tornado VM will tell us, I know you're running with the sequential thread, but now if you switch to this device at this time, you're gonna run faster than it used to be. Now, how this decision ma logic made? Well, we introduced policies. Uh, we have three for now. We focus on performance. And uh, we have what we call end-to-end -end performance, peak performance, and latency. The end-to-end -end performance will encounter in the decision, JIT compilation and execution, okay, including data transfer. Peak performance will not encounter JIT, uh, JIT compilation, only execution. And then we'll make the decision. These two modes were for all the devices in order to make a decision that could be very slow. That's why we introduced a third component, a third policy called latency, which means I spawn a set of Java threads, the first one to finish, just go over it, okay? Okay, in fact, I have a demo to show you this. So, uh, this is hard to show. We have another call in the API that we can switch the device, and that's what we're gonna show you. But the internal logic is the same. So let me start with the code. I have a server client application, um, .java. The server will open a socket and the server has a one task schedule. We'll, run, we'll try to run one task on the GPU. It's a very simple, it's just vector addition. And the server, the run method, will wait for the client to tell in which device you want to run. And then the client can change the device at any point at runtime. So the server will still be open, right? Uh, by the way, all the example, all the examples I've shown you today are available on GitHub. You can easily reproduce them and read the code. And let me show you that. So on the left hand side, this side, I'm gonna run the server. Okay, that's the flags I use. I'm gonna print the kernel. But I'm gonna run with debug just to tell me which device is running. And on the right hand side, I'm gonna run the client. And now it's, it's, it's stopped there to wait for a device in which 
to run the task. Let's run on device zero. Important bit, I select the GPU, compile and run, okay? Now I select the second device. Uh, it's an Intel CPU multicore. Then the next one is a multicore but with different OpenCL driver. Compile and run for all of those, for all of them. And finally, the integrated graphics. And I have been switching without restarting the application. In fact, now I can switch, you know, let's run on zero again on the NVIDIA. I didn't now compile, I just run it. The code is already in the code cache. Obviously, binaries are different because devices are different. And now I can run, let's run on device one, let's run on zero again, zero again, let's run on the Intel graphics, let's run on the NVIDIA, let's run on the multicore, and so on and so forth. And I haven't restarted the application, okay? Cool, I hope I convinced you that this is a nice feature to have for Manos languages. In fact, what we propose is something like this. So, um, are you familiar with hotspots, some of the internals of how, how hotspot compile code? So you might have that, for example, OpenJDK have a few compilers, C1 and C2, by default is C2, or you might have the Graal compiler, but as soon as you reach the maximum level, C2 or Graal, you cannot get faster. That's not possible. However, if we plug in the dynamic reconfiguration, we might get something faster after all. That's the whole idea. So Tornado VM will say, I know you're running with the code that C2 was produced, but if we switch to multi-core, you're gonna get faster, and then over again, if you switch to a GPU, you're gonna get even faster. Why is this switching? Because you might run an expression with different input sizes, for example, and depending on the input size, you might switch device. By the way, don't run on a GPU if you only have a few elements to run. So at least 1,000 threads to run on a GPU, otherwise the GPU is on holidays, right? Okay, um, just to mention a few related works, in the context of Java, there are plenty out there. Um, just to summarize, well, let me say, tell you this. So you might hear about Aparapi project or IBM GNI. They support only GPUs. Aparapi support multi-core as well because they target OpenCL. There are a few other projects. That, that, this one actually is my PhD thesis. Um, with, in my opinion, Tornado is the one that supports more devices because we can support GPUs, FPGAs, and multi-core. We can perform task migration, and as far as I know, there is no other one that can do that. We can perform uh, specializations at runtime, and I'm not aware for the project doing that, doing that, and we can target also dynamic languages. By the way, just to, for reference, because a lot of people ask me about that, GRCUDA, I put it here, but GRCUDA is a framework on top of Truffle, okay? But the code you write is CUDA, not JavaScript or R, it's CUDA, okay? But I put it for reference, but there are a lot of differences between GRCUDA and Tornado VM. With Tornado, you just write Java, which I believe is much higher level. Okay, so let me show you performance in a real setup. And I want to show you the dynamic reconfiguration in action in a, in a server. And how to, read, how to read this graph, don't worry. So X axis shows input size, Y axis shows speed up against hotspot. I have two applications, DFT, and in body. And uh, the dots or the squares is I run Tornado on that device without switching. I don't care, I just run on this, no matter what. And the line is I run Tornado with the ability of doing the task migration. And let's focus on the DFT end-to-end -end policy. Tornado will say for small input sizes, stay with hotspot, they do a very good job. As soon as the data increases, Tornado VM will switch execution from hotspot to the GPU, and will continue from there. And similar situation applies for other benchmarks, okay? Um, wait, we can run, uh, I show you through the demos, but we can run on many devices. In fact, we can run also AMD, GPUs. And one important thing I want to highlight, Tornado doesn't get performance for all benchmarks, okay? In fact, for example, SaxPy, which you have a huge amount of data to copy to the device, one or two operations to do on the device, and a huge amount of data to copy back. That, that doesn't work for GPUs or FPGAs, okay? And in fact, Tornado, you will get slowed down. But for other type of applications, Black Scholes, Mandelbrot, Embody for physics, matrix multiplication for deep learning, DFT stuff, Tornado is a very good suite for running uh, on heterogeneous devices. 
If you're interested, we have a bunch of papers. Um, they, th those are available in our GitHub repository, if you are interested. And actually, there are more coming. OK, so obviously, let's talk now about limitations. We have limitations. Um, and most of the limitations are bound because of the problem model we use underneath. Uh, we use OpenCL underneath. And OpenCL doesn't support, for example, recursion. So we don't support recursion on the device. We don't support objects. Well, kind of. We support some type of objects. The objects, we know the data layout. Um, for example, the matrix multiplication, remember the matrix 2D, 3D, those are objects. We support those. Uh, we don't support dynamic memory allocation, kind of. In some cases, we do. Why? Because we compile a runtime. And a runtime, if we know the size of the array, we can kind of simulate dynamic allocation, but it's not, right? Uh, and we don't support exceptions. We might support exceptions in the future. And this is a bit, a bit controversial because, in my opinion, supporting all these features on these devices, these devices are not thought for running this kind of stuff. So if we want to force, to force this, we might not get the speed that we want. The philosophy we, uh, we took with Tornado VM is run when the application, when your workload makes sense to run in there. Otherwise, just stay with Hotspot. They do a very good job. So rather than competing against Hotspot, it's a complement to Hotspot or Graal. For future work, we have many things in progress. Um, we are running, we, we are trying to integrate uh, more uh, JIT specializations okay, in the JIT compiler. Uh, so you know that GPUs have different memory, memory tiers, like constant memory, local memory, global memory, private memory. Uh, other projects like Aparapi, what they do is they expose an API, a set of API calls for each individual region. What we're trying to do, we have a PhD student working on that. Uh, what he's doing is automatically, in the IR, exploit which level to insert and automatically generate the code for that. And that could be, give you very good speed ups in an automatic manner. Other thing we want to investigate is energy policies. So we focus now on performance, but think about this. If we can switch, not because performance requirements, but energy requirements, run this method on this device because you consume less energy. That would be cool. So this is work in progress, OK? We're working on that. Another thing we're working is, uh, for example, uh, we're plugging in a PTX backend underneath. So instead of OpenCL, run with NVIDIA only. But hopefully, we can get slightly better performance. So I'm finalizing the presentation. I want to give you um, a few slides, a few things about how this is currently being used by industry. So Tornado VM is part of an European project called e Data. I will need another talk to explain the project, but just a sentence. What we do is to run Apache Flink, map reduce workloads on heterogeneous cluster. OK, automatically. And for that, we plug in Tornado on the final <coughs> node. And the final node will contain a bunch of heterogeneous hardware. So ideally, you will just type your map reduce computation with Flink, no changes in the primary model, no extensions, and everything will run, if we can't, on heterogeneous devices automatically. So this is work in progress. So if you like this project, stay tuned. Um, we are working, to, we have a prototype actually working. So, but stay tuned or feel free to ask me later for more details. Then uh, there is a company called Exus, it's here in London. They, what they do is they are using Tornado for machine learning. The goal of the application is uh, they want to predict the number of patients to be readmitted in a particular hospital to predict resources, to predict you know, how um, medicals, uh, doctors, and so on. And for doing that, what they did is they trained a machine learning model in Java. And the sequential code runs around 2,600 seconds. And by using Tornado, they went down to 188 se uh, uh, seconds, OK? So 40 times faster, 14 times faster. OK, just to sum up, um, Tornado is also open source. It's on GitHub. It's fully available on GitHub. Uh, check it out. We have last release last week. In that release, we introduced these dynamic languages with GraalVM. We also have Docker images. In fact, the demo I show you with Node.js is through Docker. 
So I, I, my, my personal advice is if you want to give a try to Tornado, just use the Docker images because you don't have to mess around with the driver installation, OK? Uh, we have two types for GPUs by NVIDIA are for Intel integrated graphics. Um, we have a team. Um, I'm, I have to personally thank all members of the team. We have a small team, but they are doing a great, very good job. Mostly we are uh, research staff, academic staff, and PhD, student, PhD students. They are working on different aspects of, of Tornado, uh, like the optimizations, uh, the, the Flink, part, uh, and we have a bunch of students recently working on how to accelerate deep learning with Tornado. And we are also looking for feedback and collaboration. So we want to hear, to hear from you what you think about this, if you are missing something, and yeah, feel free to talk to us. I will be the whole day here. So yeah, feel free to reach me. So just to summarize, takeaways, I have shown you that Today's computing uh, devices are heterogeneous, okay? Heterogeneous devices are everywhere. There is no way to escape. The thing is how to program efficiently. I show you one alternative to program by using Tornado. With that, you can target any high-level program language. By that, I mean Java, R, Ruby, and run it uh, transparently on heterogeneous hardware. I have shown you also a way to do task migration. I believe this is a really cool feature. Uh, I hope I convinced you that we can do that. And you can get very high speed. We're not talking about 100x. We're, we're talking about 1,000x, OK, 4,000x, as I showed you before. And this is because we run with the capabilities of the device, OK? And that's all for my presentation. So if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, perhaps you need a mic. Uh, first of all, very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I noticed when you ran one of your examples that your computer said your GPU memory is running low. Um, Sorry, say again? I noticed that your computer was telling you your GPU memory was running low when you ran one of your ah, examples. Ah, yeah, yeah, I was. Is, is, does it uh, do any kind of automatic cleanup? Of, I mean, you're copying code to the GPU, right? Does it do cleanup of that as well? Good question. So we run Tornado in isolation, and obviously after running Tornado, we do a cleanup phase, obviously. Yes. Yes. You have some other question for that? No, thank you first. Um, but uh, the, one, one of your slides, when you, were, you had the matrix comparing all of the different um, so Projects. Run, run, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it said that Tornado wasn't production ready. Um, so not yet, asterisk. Um, yeah. What's, we are, uh, what's, what, what do you need to do? So we are pushing for something else. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we support more things than others. Uh, but for now, we are running as a part of the academic project. So I guess what we need to do is to get a use case from um, a company and make them useful. One of those is Exus. Uh, hopefully they, want, they, they can make it you know, in production for now, because we are running on the European project. For now, it's academic. That's what I mean, not yet. For me, I will say, yes, of course, use it. Yeah. Any thoughts on using TPUs? Yeah, good point. Um, if the TPU supports OpenCL, uh, yes, why not? Um, we were thinking to introduce um, um, LLVMIR and uh, perhaps go through you know, this project by Google that can target TPUs from the, this IR. But we don't have students working on that right now. Um, but that's one of the internal things we're discussing to, to get more backends. One of the backends we're building right now is a new one, it's a PTX. Uh, Um, well, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> do ask one questions directly. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. Um, Thank you. Our next talk is on building WebAssembly compilers, so please stay and learn more. But um, thanks very much for that great talk. Thank you. Thank you.